Yard has been recognized by the National Wildlife Federation as a wildlife sanctuary. It's something anybody can actually do if they meet certain qualifications. We would like to give you a tour of our yard and go over what parts of it meet the different requirements for certification for wildlife habitat. It's that you provide water, food, cover, which means places to shelter, and places for raising young. And the fifth one they just added is sustainability, that you do it in a sustainable method. Okay, let's start with our shade garden out front here. This whole area is heavy shade under this Japanese maple tree, which we planted probably 25 years ago. Originally, when we planted the tree, we had a goldfish pond out front here, but that over after 20 years of goldfish pond, we changed it to a fountain. The tree, first of all, provides shade, of course, but it also provides a lot of shelter and housing. You know, we have birds nest in it. We've hung some bird feeders, I'm, I'm sorry, bird houses in there to provide additional nesting, and they do get used by wrens and chickadees. We have a mixture of plants, some native and some not native. We're not purists. Everything isn't native. We try to use a lot of native plants, but there are some interesting plants that we like that we, we put in for color or whatever reason. So we're gonna talk about this area here, which is along the sidewalk and in a bit, and down the end it goes in. It's primarily our pollinator garden. There's many, many plants specifically chosen by us to feed bees, wasps, butterflies, all kinds of pollinators hummingbirds as well. And the, the bright red plants are favorites of hummingbirds. But we have a lot of milkweed in here, the Joe Pie weed, which is the tall purple stuff, that is also pollinator. And if you look carefully, you can see it's just constantly alive with bees and wasps and moths and butterflies flitting around. We have many different kinds of bees and wasps. Some of them are honeybees from our own hives, but most of them are native bees and wasps, and it's, it's very important to provide food for them. They are on the decline. Insects worldwide are dropped by like 45% in the last 10 years, and that's a serious crisis because a lot of our food and many plants are dependent on pollinators for their life. And they're different from honeybees, and that honeybees will stay in the hive and survive all winter long in the hive. But these other bees and wasps, they don't overwinter. There'll be a queen or, or a few of them that survive in the ground or under leaves to reemerge in the spring. It's so important that people do not totally clean their yards. It's extremely important that you leave piles of leaves, you leave piles of wood so that these insects can overwinter. Because if you keep a pristine lawn and a pristine yard, not a lot's gonna live there. A good example is just something like this, the stem of a dead flower. It's hollow. An insect will crawl in there and spend the winter in that shelter, buried under the snow, but he has a place to live. So if you clear up every single piece of this dead material in the fall, they have no place to overwinter. I wanted to point out in this area, the pollinator garden, there are such a variety of bees and wasps and butterflies and you can see, if you look really carefully, you may not be able to see it on the camera, but there's many tiny, tiny, tiny bees. And uh, they are called, some of them are called mason bees. This is a mason bee house. And each of these little holes, what the mason bee does is it finds a little hole and it lays an egg in it, puts some pollen and, and nectar in there for the, for the young, and then frosts it over with mud, like a mason. You know, he, he uses his skills to, to cover it over. And then once the baby hatches, it digs its way out and escapes. So this type of a house will allow the mason bees to have a place to live, uh, provides more opportunity in addition to what little pieces they can find in the yard. Okay, this area of the yard, we uh, had professionally landscaped at one time, uh, many years ago. Uh, had a few trees put in and a lot of shrubs that were native shrubs. One thing I'd like to point out is this particular tree, which is a thundercloud plum, is susceptible to something called black knot virus or fungus, black knot fungus. And this tree is really suffering from it and we're gonna to have to take it down. In this area, there's a lot of native plants. There's summer sweet, which is a clethra. There's sweet spire, which is an itea. It's a form of holly. The big uh, pine tree over there is a 
Uh, Japanese umbrella pine, that is not native, but it's one of our favorites. Again, I mentioned we're not purists, but that's our favorite tree in the yard. And it's also somewhat unusual. It only grows in the native, in, in the wild, on one island in Japan, but it is available here, and we like it. Um, the, the idea that a lot of these plants are native uh, requires some definition of what native means, because there's some interpretations of that. The woman who landscaped this for us brought two catalogs of plants that she considered native. One is just native plants that live here now. The other catalog was plants that lived here before the Ice Age and do not now live here. And that she considers to be native because they can live here now and they used to live here 15,000 years ago. Uh, so there's a couple of plants here that do meet that qualification. One of them is our sourwood tree, which is in bloom now. And that tree is interesting, not only because that was here before the Ice Age, but it has these racemes of flowers that hang down, and the remains of them are still there now, and it will be there even when the leaves turn their autumn reddish color. So it's one of the few trees in the world that has its flowers and its autumn colors at the same time. Here I have a couple of interesting plants I'd like to show you. This one is a climbing hydrangea. We planted it probably 15, 20 years ago as one small stem. It's now covered a great deal of the fence here. It's flowered profusely, as you can see. These are the remains of the flowers, but it's so dense that we have a number of different birds nesting in there. We had a pair of mourning doves raise babies in there this year. And that was the first time we've actually found a morning dove nest. I happened to see one go in there and they came out and I went over and investigated and there was a little nest balanced on the leaves and, and, and the, the branches in there with a baby on it. So that was kind of fun. This plant here is a dogwood. It's a native dogwood, Cornus, Florida. And we did not plant it. It just showed up one day from some bird carrying a fruit or a dropping that had a seed in it or whatever. Uh, and I like to do that. When things are only about this tall, I try to figure out what they are because sometimes it's something you want to pluck up before it gets to be big, but other times it's something that you might like to just let go and see what it turns into. Uh, this turned into a dogwood tree that I'm now going to let get as big as it wants because it happened to land in a spot that's good to us. So that's interesting that you can look for little things and let them have a chance to develop and see what they are. This is one of the more interesting plants in the yard. This is an eastern prickly pear cactus. And yes, I said eastern. It actually grows native in eastern Massachusetts on the Cape and other parts of the east coast. This cactus can survive the winters here. We don't mulch it or cover it in the winter. In the winter, the leaves go limp. And if you didn't know the plant, you would think that they were dead. They'd look like mush laying on the ground. But in the spring, as soon as they warm up, they stand right back up. And this plant is probably 10 years old now. This boulder we have here was not here originally. We needed a place for our bees to drink. And when we were going through the recycling place, we, we naturally saw this as a drinking fountain for the, the bees that we have. The bees are right over the fence here. Okay. This week, I had put a feeder on top of the beehive. We have two beehives, they're honeybees. We acquired them when local beekeeper had to relocate his 20 or 30 hives that he had. So we said, sure, we'll take a couple. So he came and he sets them up and he takes care of the honey and he takes care of the hives, which is great. And we get a couple of good sized jars of honey free from him every year. This area, one time it was a deep shade garden because this tree right here was a full grown adult Norway maple. Over the last couple of years it started dying, so we ended up having to cut it. Norway maples are invasive species. You can't even buy them. It's illegal to sell them in Massachusetts now. But when this neighborhood was developed in 1960 or late 50s, this was the street tree of choice. The shade tree in the people's yard. You look up and down the streets in this area and they're all either red or green Norway maples. People didn't understand the invasive nature of them at the time. So anyways, we had to cut it. And what we did was we leave a stump, six to 10 foot, it's called a snag. And it's recommended that you do that because this becomes wildlife habitat. Uh, bugs get in there, uh, the, the bark is falling off and so bugs can get up underneath. 
Uh, we put a house on top, which we hope somebody will occupy. It hasn't happened yet. It might be too much sun. It's actually a squirrel house. In theory, sold as a squirrel house, correct. But these snags are very important. We've got three or four in the yard. We had one several years ago that we left, and even taller than this, it was probably 15 foot tall. And over a period of five to 10 years, it decayed, uh, bugs ate at it, and then the bug holes turned into woodpecker holes, and the woodpecker holes turned into holes that birds nested in. And that hole became big enough that in that spring, a raccoon moved in. Talk about it. And then uh, we discovered that the raccoon had two babies. So uh, it was really fun watching the babies develop and start to walk around. And then everyone that walked up and down the street could see that the raccoon, half of her body was actually sticking out the hole because she was so big and the hole was so small that the hole really was only big enough for the babies. So she would have limbs hanging out and then people walking by would stop and say, do you realize you have a raccoon hanging out of that tree? And of course we knew that. <laughs> but it was, it was a fun summer because people got to experience baby raccoons and they were excited about it. They didn't want to kill them. They didn't have rabies. So um, it was fun. And she was there with the two babies until my dogs discovered them. And the babies started walking down when mummy wasn't there. So then my dog started chasing them. And once that happened, that was it. She had had enough. And within two days, she and the babies were off somewhere else and we never saw them again. She carried them away. But for her to nurse the babies in that tiny hole, she basically had to stick her stomach inside the hole and leave some limbs hanging out <laughs> in this odd posture that uh, was fun to watch. <laughs> we have here is another shade garden that we have planted ourselves over the years. To point out, we've actually been here 30 years, so there's been a lot of time to develop this. Some things we plant, it doesn't make it. It's, it's, a lot of it is trial and error. You plant something, it doesn't work. You plant something else, it thrives, then that plant belongs there. That's the way we look at it. We don't always design something perfectly, plant it, and have everything thrive. It just doesn't work that way. So there's a number of plants here that offer a variety of color, leaf shapes, habitat. We have some ferns that are native. There's cinnamon ferns. These ferns here are cinnamon ferns that we actually stole from neighboring forests. There's a lot of jack-in-the-pulpits, these three-leafed plants. Many of them, the bigger ones we did buy and plant, but a lot of the small native ones, again, they just showed up. And once we see the three leaves coming up and realize it's not poison ivy, uh, then we will just let it grow. So some of this has happened on its own. The other thing we really tried to do is have a variety of plants that flower at different times, have flowers all year long. These yellow flowers that you can see coming up are Ligularia, and up until now they've been pretty drab plants, and now suddenly it's their time of the year, we have all these flowers. This is Beer's Britches, and this, I believe this is a native plant. It prefers a little bit of sun and does really well in the shade. Right now, it, it doesn't have its flowers anymore, but it has these beautiful bluish purple flowers in the summertime, and it, the bees just absolutely love it. And it's one of my favorite plants. I'm gonna get more of those. Also, in the spring, with our ferns, we have, of course, we have rabbit problems like everybody else around here. So we had to buy these little domes because once the fiddle heads come up, the rabbits love them. So if we get to them in time, we put the domes on them, and even if sometimes when we don't, they will start to re, re come up again, and then we'll put a dome on it. And if we don't do that, we don't get our ferns in the summertime. And this, this is an interesting plant here. This is actually St. John's wort, and it has tiny little yellow flowers on it. It's, it's past its flowering, and now is starting to make little berries. Commonly used as a medicinal plant. Right. We often split plants, and some of these, like hostas, some of these hostas, you can just take a shovel and drive it right down the middle of the plant, dig it up, and you got two plants, and it'll thrive perfectly fine. Uh, a lot of the times, plants get too big. We cut them up and swap with other gardeners, and you know, we get some of their plants, they take some of our plants. It's, uh, it's fun that, to do that way. A lot of them expand and expand and expand. Eventually, you end up with an area that's so heavily, densely planted 
The benefit of that is there's no room for weeds to grow. We haven't really had to weed this whole area at all this year because it's just already got as many plants as it can sustain. I'm so glad you said that, Bill. This area right here. <laughs> <laughs> because Bill and I have fought for years over this. Oh. Because Bill's type of gardening is a plant here, a plant there with mulching. And my type of gardening is really dense because I do the weeding. So he's finally starting to come around. Not my problem, man. Weeding is not my problem. <laughs> this is a May apple, which is a form of spring ephemeral because it grows these little apples here. And these are really almost ripe. Each plant has one flower, which is underneath the plant. You can't even see it unless you get on the ground and look at it. We talked about in the certification for wildlife habitat that water and food are two important items. We've talked about some of the natural sources of food already, the berries, the may apples, and flowers for the pollinators. We also provide some food that isn't natural in the sense that it's not growing. We put it out. We have feeders for sunflowers. We have another feeder for seeds with a platform back there. We also provide water. This bird bath here is a heated bird bath. It has a cord and there's a power source right un underneath it. We can just plug it in in the winter and there's a liquid water for the birds all winter long. Um, not all birds will eat snow, so sometimes it's really difficult for them to find a spot to drink in the winter, so that's an important part of it. In the summer, we only provide these two bird feeders because there's plenty of natural food around. In the winter, we put out uh, suet, we put out some woodpecker food. Uh, Jane will take peanut butter and just smear it into the cracks of the tree and watch the squirrels come and pick at it and feed and eat it. It's fun to watch because we can see right from our windows. Um, this is an interesting feeder for us. This is our favorite feeder because not only the birds use it all day long and the red squirrels can actually get inside the opening, but every single night for the last five years anyways, every single night the flying squirrel will show up and they come down and they're tiny. They're more like flying chipmunks. They're tiny little things. They can easily fit through the opening. They go in, grab a seed, and go up the tree, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, for a couple hours every night. It's a lot of fun to watch. We've had from one to as many as seven at a time, uh, flying back and forth, and they, we actually see them fly from tree to tree. A uh, flying squirrel doesn't actually flap and fly. It's more like a glider. It can go from high up on a tree and glide over to here. It would have to then climb back up to do it again. But uh, it is fun to watch. And people are often surprised that we have flying squirrels. They think they're highly unusual. They're not highly unusual. They're quite common, but they are entirely nocturnal. So you rarely see them. The only reason we ever discovered that we actually had them was I was out bringing out the trash in the dark one night, and this was swinging like crazy. And my first reaction was, oh, it must be a squirrel. And I said, wait a minute, gray squirrels aren't out at nighttime. What the heck is going on? So we watched it and discovered we had flying squirrels. So keep that in mind, if, you have your, if your feeder is swinging around at night, you probably have flying squirrels. So not all wildlife in this yard is natural or native. Uh, we have a couple of small dogs that may have wandered through the picture, but we also have chickens. We have two different breeds of chickens here. We have Rhode Island Reds and some white Leghorns. We have them just because it's fun and they provide eggs. We have seven chickens. We probably get five or six eggs every day all summer and fall. Fall, they will taper off and stop laying because in the fall they have to shed their feathers and grow their winter coat. So uh, they use the energy instead of laying eggs, they use it to grow new feathers. And they probably won't lay for two or three months over the winter and then in the spring they start laying again. The coop, we never had chickens before until we saw this coop at the uh, Boston Flower Show one time and there was a guy selling this coop and he called it Hobbit Hole Coops as you can see why. And Jane said we're buying that and I said we don't have chickens and she said we do now. So. We got the chicken coop, we put it in, and we had this fence enclosure, including on the top to keep the hawks out. We also have put in this feeder here. The chickens have learned to step on it to have access to the food, and then they take it off and it closes. And it's been fun, we've thoroughly enjoyed it, and it turns out it attracts wildlife as well. We have chipmunks in there all the time stealing food. We have, you know, squirrels. Uh, uh, we have had every single night now, I, I just put a camera on my shed so I can see the coop at night, Every single night there's a possum that comes over the top and walks around on the coop investigating it. He can't get in, fortunately, but um, it's fascinating to, to see what happens when you put something like this in the yard. It does attract other animals. And then this sandbox here, 
with a turtle that I found in somebody's trash. The sandbox is for them to take dirt baths. The uh, chickens and other birds love to have dirt baths. And it's a mixture of sand, diatom powder, and fireplace ash. And what it does is that the sand helps control the oil on their feathers, but it also helps to kill any ticks uh, or mites and things like that that might be on their skin. They love going in there. And another benefit of having chickens is that we let them free range. Once a week or so, we let them out and they roam around the yard and they eat insects. They eat ticks as one of their primary foods. Uh, if you, we, we have dogs and we always used to have an occasional tick on our dogs. Since we've had chickens, we have no more ticks on our dogs. They can find them. I don't know how they find them, but they find the bugs everywhere. They also scratch, turn over the soil, they poop, so you get some uh, organic material mixed in. So they're actually good for your garden as well. All right, this is the back corner of my yard. Uh, this is actually, this fence is actually my property line. And behind us is an area that was recently flagged and determined to be wetland. Uh, as this property was developed about two years ago and they wanted to clear cut it and build a new house, the conservation uh, department got them to bring in a wetland scientist and do an assessment and she actually flagged some little blue flags here and there that marked the perimeter of this is now a wetland. And as long as it's greater than 500 square feet, which this clearly is, it becomes a uh, jurisdictional wetland. And then beyond the wetland, there is a buffer zone. The first 20 feet is called the do not disturb. You can't do anything beyond 20 feet. So the stone border that you see up there, the stone wall, that is the 20 foot no disturb. They put it right along there and part of the developing the project. So it protected this land from tree cutting, which is my favorite part of it. It also affects me because I'm in the buffer zone to it for 100 feet, which is a lot of my yard, so I can't cut trees either uh, without going to conservation and making sure that cutting the trees is not going to harm the wetland, and if I do cut some, I might have to replace them. I think that's great. I don't want to cut trees. I want to protect them. So all these trees are protected now, and you can see there's just a different type of, of habitat in there for the plants. All that low stuff is uh, jewelweed, which is a, a plant that indicates that it might be wet. So, and there's ferns and stuff in there, so it's a lot of wetland. So looking at that wetland, when they came and flagged the wetland, I wasn't home, so they didn't get an opportunity to come into my yard, but I assume there's another 10 or 15 feet here that would have been wetland as well. So I'm trying to protect it as wetland. You can see there's jewel weed all over the side here. And then in this corner, I have planted six different wetland shrubs to try to have some plants in there that are indeed supporting a wetland habitat. I think that's very, very important that that be done. There's so many wetlands around this area. This is a low-lying area in town. Uh, I honestly believe in 1950, when this whole neighborhood was designed, they brought in tons of landfill. Uh, if the Wetlands Protection Act existed in 1950, half of the town, half, half of the houses in Burlington wouldn't exist today. Uh, this was all filled wetlands. So there are spots that wetlands still exist. That people in, on the other side of the street still get water in their yards all the time because there is wetlands and there's underground water table uh, that is quite shallow. And if people cut their trees, trees soak up an immense amount of water. A single adult maple or oak can suck up 100 gallons of water a day. So, and it that removes it from the ground. And if you cut those trees down, that water then stays in the ground and you have more flooding than you did before you cut the trees. If I ever cut all of these trees, I think my wetland would extend halfway across my property. Uh, so it's very important that people understand the role the trees have in uh, stormwater protection. Okay, this area uh, is in the back of the yard along one of my 15 foot setbacks from the boundary. Um, I think it's very important that people protect those 15 foot setbacks from the rear property lines with trees and plants. Uh, there's been some uh, motion by the conservation to put into some of their regulations that tree cutting, if a lot is to be developed, tree cutting should not be allowed in the 15 foot setbacks. Uh, so I have purposely kept mine uh, as, as planted as I can a matter of fact, in the last year, I put in a half a dozen evergreen trees here. Uh, most of them are native. Two of these are uh, eastern red cedars, which are native. There's two more red cedars and there's a couple of arborvitaes. Um, I think it's vitally important and they're already, I mean, they've only been here less than a year. They were planted this spring 
and there's constantly little birds coming and going in them because it's a nice little sheltered spot for them to uh, get in there and hide and be able to take a break. I don't know if you can see from the camera, but there's like a hole in the ground right here. Something lives there. I have no idea what it is. It's probably a chipmunk, but I don't know. Could be I have moles, I have voles, I have chipmunks. I've had weasels in the yard. I mean, there's a number of different things that could be making that. I look at it as a positive, but there's something living there. And we also have some plants along here. These are azaleas, and they're, they're pretty, and they're, they provide, again, some shelter. Beside them is a number of blueberry bushes. We have three blueberry bushes, high boy blueberries, high bush blueberries, that provided more blueberries this year than we've ever had, and we didn't eat a single one of them because by the time they ripened, they were gone. So, you know, but again, it was a constant flow of birds. I've seen a robin go over, stand on a shaky branch, literally jump up and down and knock the blueberries on the ground, and then go down on the ground and eat them. So, you know, it's what, that's why we planted them. So we try to have as many native plants as we can. We try to provide habitat, food, water, shelter, Places to raise your young, those are the items that are make this a certifiable wildlife habitat. And sustainability. Sustainability means not using fertilizers, you know, inorganic fertilizers, not using pesticides. My lawn looks pretty good, I think, and yet I don't use any chemicals on it at all. The only thing I put on my lawn is a product called Milorganite, and it is actually made from composted human waste from the town, from the city of Milwaukee waste treatment plant. So it's or totally organic um, and it's recycling human waste, which is disgusting as it sounds, is actually my lawn is thriving in it. And I, if I see a plant that I don't want coming up in my lawn, I pluck it out. I don't spray it with anything. I'm getting yelled at by a bird that doesn't want me here. Um, so, it, you know, you can have a lawn without chemicals and you can provide habitat you can provide all those things that are important. Encouraging wildlife in your yard. The number one thing, in my opinion, is diversity. The more things you put in your yard, the more things can live there. I like to look at my yard, my property, as one organism in which I am just one of the living species. I'm not trying to take over the yard and control everything. I'm trying to live with the items that grow here. And I think that's the way Jane and I have raised the yard for 30 years. And we do our part to help other people do that as well. She's in the garden club, I'm on the conservation. We try to spread the word, if you will, about the kind of gardening that we do and that we think it's something that other people should do as well. And you may have noticed in the whole tour, we don't even grow vegetables. We just never have. We tried it once or twice, but they get immediately devoured by the animals that live here. So rather than building cages around everything, we stopped growing vegetables. But we enjoy the garden the way we do grow it, and I think so do many other inhabitants of our yard.